Hi, I'm here today to take you through the genetics of a person, me, that thrives on a ketogenic diet. So first of all, who am I? My name is Jocelyn. I'm 35 years old. I'm married. I have a couple of kids. I have been following a cyclic ketogenic diet since January of 2017, which as of right now is two and a half years. And I have been doing CrossFit since 2008, so more than a decade now. And I've been documenting what that's like to follow a um, ultra low carb, high fat diet while training in a high intensity sport like CrossFit on an Instagram account called The Keto Athlete. Um, also now has a website, uh, theketoathlete.org. So in my 35 years on this planet, here are some things I've already figured out about myself. I can gain muscle easily. I can build muscle easily. I can also get fat easily. I can gain weight just looking at a carb. <laughs> um, I feel the best if I stick to a diet of meat, especially red meat, eggs, nuts. Um, I feel better if I avoid dairy, grains, leafy things. Um, I feel the best if I stick to a time-restricted eating schedule where I'm only actually consuming food for a few hours of the day, usually eight hours probably on average, sometimes four to six if I can manage it. Um, so I had my genetic testing done through 23andMe, and then I took the raw data and also fed it through Dr. Rhonda Patrick's tool at her website at foundmyfitness.com, so that's where all of the following information comes from. So we're going to start off with my ancestry. Where am I from? I'm 100% European, specifically Northern European, from Austria and Germany on my mom's side, England and Wales on my dad's side. Um, so all of my ancestors come from the colder climates of Northern Europe and then immigrated to the cold climate of Canada, where I live now. Um, and I also contain 84% more Neanderthal DNA than all of the people that have had their genetics sequenced on 23andMe. Why that might be relevant, um, new research coming out that um, Northern Europeans find it difficult to stick to a the sort of mainstream Mediterranean style diet that lacks enough uh, red meat and um, high fat products. Food that would have been available to my Northern European ancestors, there would have been very little plant matter available for the majority of the year. Um, they would have subsisted on probably large game animals, you know, elk, reindeer, buffalo, all those kinds of things that are available in Northern climates. Neanderthal, Pretty reliable evidence now says that they ate um, mostly meat. So both of those things together might explain why I feel the best on a predominantly meat-based diet. So celiac disease. One of the first things that pops up as a genetic predisposition for me is this gene having to do with celiac disease. Now celiac is a intolerance to gluten, which is a protein found in mostly wheat, but other grains as well. I don't have celiac disease, but this could be part of why I feel better on a diet that eliminates um, grains. Crohn's disease, I also don't have Crohn's disease, but I carry the slightly increased risk associated with impaired vitamin C transport. Now, insulin and vitamin C compete for the same uptake receptors, these glute receptors on the surface of any cell. And in that competition, insulin is always gonna win. Insulin's the transporter bringing in mostly glucose. Um, so if there's chronically elevated levels of glucose and therefore insulin, that insulin's always gonna outcompete the vitamin C getting into the cell. Vitamin C is an important antioxidant, so um, it's much better for the health of all of your cells if you can keep glucose and therefore insulin low so that the vitamin C can get in there and do its job. So PPAR alpha, this is the gene um, most directly associated with your ability to adapt to a ketogenic diet. PPAR alpha plays an important role in the liver's ability to produce ketone bodies beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate endogenously, so within your own body. Now, I carry the normal genotype here, the CC variant of PPR alpha, which means I'm good or perfectly fine at producing ketones in my liver. Now, I think this is important to point out that I have seen some nutrition experts out there say things like, a ketogenic diet can't possibly work for an athlete, and if it does, you're just some kind of freakish outlier. I think it's important to point out that the ability to adapt to a ketogenic diet is the normal variant here. There are other less common, more rare variants of PPR alpha that make people not very good at producing ketones in the liver. So an inability to adapt to a ketogenic diet would be the freakish outlier. The norm is the ability to produce ketones just fine. So body weight. 
I said at the beginning, I can gain muscle easily. I can also get fat easily. I am genetically predisposed to weigh more than average. I carry 376 genetic variants that would predispose me to obesity. A lot of my family has struggled with obesity and I used to really feel like, ugh, I have crappy genetics. And I've stopped saying that now because I don't have crappy genetics. My genetics are awesome. What I do have are genetics that are highly incompatible with a modern lifestyle of inactivity and lots of crappy processed foods. So living a lifestyle with lots of activity through CrossFit and eating you know, mostly meats and nuts and fatty things, I am able to maintain my body weight just fine, um, fairly effortlessly. Lactose. So this one has to do with something called ALP, adult lactase persistence. Lactase is the enzyme produced to break down lactose, which is the sugar in milk. So all mammals that are breastfed uh, produce this lactase enzyme when we're infants and up to the age of weaning, which historically in human beings was around age three or four. And then normally we would stop producing that lactase enzyme because there would be no need for it from that point forward. There is a genetic variant of people that continue to produce this lactase enzyme through adulthood. I am not one of those people. I'm one of these 15% of Europeans that do not have adult lactase persistence. Um, I'm well aware that I feel much better if I don't have dairy in my diet. I find it makes my skin break out. It makes my asthma worse. Uh, it just doesn't sit very well in my guts. So this would explain why I do better without dairy. Sweet versus salty. I'm likely to prefer salty or savory snacks, which explains why I feel satisfied and satiated on the generally salty and savory flavors of a ketogenic diet. Um, but also here, it sort of says that I like both. I have 19 of the genetic markers, I'm likely to prefer salty, and 14, I'm likely to prefer sweet. Turns out I like both. <laughs> Who doesn't? Fasting. So this is some um, circadian-related uh, breast and prostate cancer risk, actually. So I said at the beginning that I feel the best if I keep the, the hours of the day that I actually consume food to a, a time-restricted eight or maybe six-hour window. So for every 10% increase in the proportion of calories, consumed after 5 p.m. was associated with a 3% increase in the inflammatory biomarker C-reactive protein. In a previous video, I shared the results of my blood work where my C-reactive protein was undetectable. So I have like no inflammation in my body, um, which could at least partly be explained by my time-restricted eating window. Um, and for every three hour increase in nighttime fasting, so the period of time where I'm not consuming food, was linked to a 20% lower odds of elevated HbA1c. Your HbA1c is kind of a, a lagging three-month indicator of your average blood glucose levels. Mine, if you want to go back to my previous video, you'll find it was 5%, which is nice and low, nice and normal. Um, and then keeping that time-restricted eating window, in this case, the study was on 11 hours or less, decreased breast cancer risk or recurrence by as much as 36%. So yet another great reason to stick to a time-restricted eating window. PPAR gamma. So... This is peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma, master regulator of fatty acid storage and glucose metabolism. So again, here I have the normal genotype, just like PPA or alpha. Um, if I had one of the more uh, rare genotypes of this one, I would maybe have to be more careful with the specific proportions of polyunsaturates and monounsaturates and saturated fats. But um, with the CC genotype here, I'm um, perfectly flexible at consuming all different types of fats. So the brain and fats. I am a homozygous carrier of APOE3, so I'm a 3-3. APOE has to do with how good your brain is at repairing damage. There are other variants of APOE2 where you're exceptionally good at repairing damage, and APOE4 where you are really, really not good at repairing damage. So if you carry one copy of APOE4, you're three to five times more likely to get Alzheimer's. And if you carry two copies of it, you're more than 10 times as likely to get Alzheimer's disease. I am homozygous for APOE 3.3, which means I can repair damage at the normal rate in my brain. And saturated fat does not have a negative effect on blood glucose or insulin levels, um, which is great considering I've been literally drinking butter and eating <laughs> the fattiest red meats I can find for like years now. And all of my blood work supports this, that my um, glucose and insulin and lipid levels and everything are totally normal. So the MTHFR gene, also known as the motherfucker gene, has to do with the production of the MTHFR enzyme, which is all related to processing your B vitamins, B6, B9, B12. Um, now, I carry both of the mutations in this MTHFR gene. So at the 1298 position, I'm AC. 
And at the 677 position, I'm CT. So that's a mutated copy on both those positions of the gene, which if you like to go down this rabbit hole of this sort of stuff on the internet, there's lots of talk about these MTHFR mutations um, and potential health problems they can cause um, elevated homocysteine levels, the inability to break down synthetic folic acid very well, um, can possibly lead to increased risk of stroke and cardiovascular disease and all these sorts of things, which may or may not be well supported by research just yet. Um, but one thing for sure is that I should avoid synthetic folic acid, which is the um, synthetic version of the vitamin folate, which is what's found in the body. So folic acid is the synthetic version that's added to fortified grains bread, cereals, pasta, all that kind of stuff. So again, another reason for me to avoid processed grains and cereals. So choline and B12 related things. So I'm at an increased risk of choline deficiency, even at adequate dietary choline intake levels. Um, now one of the things that choline does, lots of things, but it's an important precursor to acetylcholine, which helps your brain get into REM sleep. And this was something that I've noticed that I think will be a video all in itself is that I need to eat or supplement with a lot of choline in order to get an adequate amount of REM sleep as measured by my, I used to wear a whoop strap, now I have the Aura ring that measures the sleep data for me. Um, so choline is mostly found in egg yolks, red meat. Um, so I need to have a uh, well above average intake of those things to even meet my adequate requirement levels. I'm also at a slightly increased risk for low B12. Um, in my previous video about my blood work, I had shared, I had old blood work results from when I was 19. And one of the things that showed way back then was low B12 levels when I was just eating a standard crappy American diet. So you fast forward all these years now where I eat mostly red meat, and eggs and things like that, my B12 levels are just fine. Um, I also have a susceptibility to the norovirus, which was the one going around in the cruise ships, which luckily I don't think I've ever been exposed to. Um, other things that can, other factors that can affect B12 status um, following a strict vegetarian diet, which I would never do, uh, prolonged use of antacids, bariatric surgery, celiac disease, all these types of things, which luckily um, I have been able to avoid. Muscle. Um, I said at the beginning that I know that I can put on muscle easily, so I have this results in the ACTN3 gene where I have the common result for elite power athletes, and considering I've been involved in strength and power sports for like more than a decade, that would make sense. Um, other athleticism related things. So I have um, intermediate fast twitch muscle performance with the CT variation of this ACT and three gene. Um, individuals with this CT are highly recommended to choose high load, low repetition resistance training to build muscle and high intensity training to improve VO2 max. That part underlined in blue is exactly how you would describe CrossFit. <laughs> so that explains why. When I found CrossFit more than a decade ago, I loved it instantly and I still love it to this day because it's that um, combination of high load, low rep resistance training and that high intensity VO2 max type training. Uh, I, this is funny for anyone that knows me in real life. I have a uh, decreased endurance capacity and a resistance to aerobic training, which anybody that knows me will tell you this is highly accurate that I suck at cardio. <laughs> related type things. So chances are I will never be an elite marathon runner, but I'm doing the best I can uh, with the genetic hand that I've been dealt to at least train and do the best I can for that endurance capacity factor. So things that have been confirmed. I would do best to make the bulk of my diet meat, especially red meat, eggs, highly nutritious foods like that. It would be in my best interest to avoid grains, dairy, sugar, um, things containing gluten, synthetic vitamins, lactose, um, keep those out of my diet, keep my blood sugar low, keep my insulin levels nice and low. Um, I would do best to fast on a periodic basis and keep the hours of the day that I consume food to a shortened period of time. I should lift heavy things and I should sprint hard and get out of breath sometimes. So that's it for me and my genetics. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them. If you're looking for more info like this, please visit theketoathlete.org. Thank you.